I am so excited to welcome Aaron Morgenstern to Politics and Prose. Uh, the author of the hugely um, successful Night Circus. Uh, we're back with her highly anticipated second novel, uh, The Starless Sea. Uh, this is a book for all of us fellow, fellow bibliophiles out there, uh, those of us that just love to fall head over heels into the magical world of stories. Uh, when Zachary Ezra Rollins discovers a mysterious book in his college library that perfectly describes a scene from his childhood, uh, he follows the clues that lead him to an underground world dedicated to, to, to the protection of all the stories. It is an epic tale of love and adventure, full of hidden libraries, pirates and sword fights, secret assassins, cats, owls, and loads of sweet honey. Uh, the world created in this book is an homage to the stories of our lives and how our destinies can come to mirror that which we read over and over. Um, Aaron will be joined in conversation tonight by Beth Ann Patrick, a book reviewer and columnist for The Washington Post, NPR, Lit Hub, and others. Um, she is a member of, uh, Penn Fa uh, board member of Penn Faulkner and is currently writing a memoir for Counterpoint Press. So please join me in welcoming Aaron Morgenstern and Beth Ann Patrick to Politics and Prose. Hello. Hello, everyone. Is this on? I Is it? I can't so. tell. Okay, good. Thank you. I'm so excited because there are new chairs and they're lower, so my short little <laughs> legs can, Yay! can fit. <laughs> Yay. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Erin is going to be such a treat to hear from. And I want to say that um, we're both Smith College alums. Yes. And Yes. And there she Smith is. And, and I am really ticked, though, that we're 15 years apart, not because I um, envy her youth, but because <laughs> I wish I'd been there with her. That would have been so would have been much fun. fun. It would have been fun. Exactly. Yeah. So um, just had to give a shout out to Smith and the theater department yes. and all of its quirkiness. But you really are a theater person. You're not necessarily someone who considered yourself a writer first No, and I was a theater girl. I majored in theater at Smith. Mm -hmm. I got my degree in theater and then decided not to do theater anymore, <laughs> which was not, not so good on timing. <laughs> and my parents were not very pleased about that at all. Um, but I did lots of theater and I did a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really find that one theater thing that I wanted to pursue professionally. Mm -hmm. I think to really be serious and pursue it, you need to have the thing you're going to do. Like, but I... I did a little bit of directing and I acted and I studied lighting design and I didn't have the one route that I wanted to take seriously. But now all of those things come in so handy when I'm writing because I get to do everything. I get to direct everything. I get to play all the parts. I what get I to really want to do is lying. direct. <laughs> it's like I wanted, I, I just like, everything can be the way I want it. Yes. And I don't have to collaborate with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, don't have to compromise. It can just be like my vision and what I want. It's kind of like, it's a little selfish, but it, it works. But, but it works. And what I wanted to say with the Starless Sea is uh, something you told an interviewer quite recently. The book has only been out for three days. It's pretty exciting. It's only been three days? Three days. Wow. <laughs> um, and you talked about the fact that you can do all the lighting mm -hmm. in a scene. And there is a lot of different lighting um, it, despite the word starless, despite the <laughs> modifier. <laughs> well, I had trouble because it's a subterranean space. And I was like, how many ways can I say th something's dark? <laughs> I, I actually went through and like word search for the word darkness at one point. I was just like, I need to take at least half of these out because we know, we know there's no natural light. <laughs> So you can have a candle flickering mm -hmm. or a lot of candles or a lamp or a sconce and all of these things help set a scene. I think it does so much for mood because mm -hmm. like if this room was lit with candlelight instead of the overheads, it would be cool. You wouldn't have to change <laughs> anything, but it would completely change the mood of the it room. Would. It would. It would change the atmosphere completely. More candle lit book events. Ooh, we, yes. I think that I, I think Let I could start it. a hashtag. Yes. <laughs> Candle lit book events. There we go. It's probably a fire hazard. <laughs> it but probably can get those about. little electric tea light ones. <laughs> can you imagine? There you go. Fire hazard. All kinds of things going on. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Love it. Um, but what happens is it's not just about the lighting. And I know that people, uh, who has read The Night Circus? Everyone, all of us, every single one, thank you. Um, who besides me has read The Starless Sea already? Yes, yeah. thank you, thank you. So in both of your books, Erin, there are a lot of sens sensory mm. details. 
And in The Starless Sea, there's a great deal about smell. And I wanted to have you talk about that for a moment. I love smell as a descriptor because I feel like a lot of times when you read books, they don't stop and describe how anything smells. Mm -hmm. I think people kind of forget it as a sensory input. So um, I like to do it because... I'm a little bit obsessed with a perfume company <laughs> called Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab. Ooh. Yay. <laughs> They're based out of California and they do all these amazing scents and they like they are the inspiration behind the tent full of uh, bottles with stories in them mm -hmm. from the Night Circus. Mm -hmm. And they're one of the reasons I always think about how evocative scent can be and how things smell. So I always want to have those like touchstone scents. So for the Starless Sea, they were kind of like beeswax candles mm -hmm. and smoke and stone. And like, um, I think at one point I have Zachary put on a sweater that smells vaguely of pancakes. And it's because that happened to me. I pulled on one of my sweaters that I hadn't washed since whatever like perfume I had on it. <laughs> I was just like, I smell like pancakes. <laughs> Syrup. And there's also clove. Yes. And uh, and uh, honey. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're going to have to, one of the things I want to say, I always say this at the events that I moderate and are, are in conversation about, I try not to give spoilers. And I'm going to ask you later when we get to the questions not to give any spoilers for either book, but especially for The Starless Sea if you have read it. However, I do want to talk about the importance of honey in The Starless Sea. Uh, anyone who looks at the jacket can tell. Um, that bees are important and there is so much that we don't have to reveal however bees and honey do play a very large there are role. a lot of bees in this a book. lot of bees <laughs> there are a lot of bees and there are a lot of honey um that i always i kind of got onto this idea of early on because the night circus has a color scheme and i didn't want something to have a color scheme but i wanted Starless to have its own sort of visual vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And one thing I hit on kind of early on was symbols. Mm -hmm. And I toyed with a lot of different things. And the one that kept coming back was the B. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it. And I was thinking over it in my head. And um, a B flew into my apartment in Manhattan, which is sort of weird. I lived in like the fifth floor apartment in Manhattan. The B flew in my window. I was just like, okay, maybe you're trying to tell me something. <laughs> and then the other thing that happened with the bees was my, a friend of mine sent me, there's a stuffed animal company called Squishables. And, and she, sent me, <laughs> she sent me the mystery box without knowing which one I would get. And I got the B. And she said, <laughs> and she said, never in a million years would I would have picked out the B for you. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe I should like think about this. And, and then all of a sudden it was just like, they worked so well and I couldn't get rid of them. And that's why there are bees in the book and also keys and also swords. And, and, all, also and, and, and we'll get, and we will get to those and, and the honey, I just want to say, um, by the, this Seems like a digression, but I swear, bear with me. So um, when you were at Smith, did, did the tunnel bar exist? Yes, right when I graduated. Like, I think I went there once. It's the best cocktail bar. It's, it's beautiful. just beautiful. And it's in this old train tunnel station thingy. And so when Zachary is drinking, he's a real cocktail guy. Yes. And I loved that, you know, he always orders a sidecar if there's nothing else interesting. Because that's what I do. Yeah, uh, there we go. Exactly. And he actually has some drinks with honey in them. He has a bee's knees at one point yes. in the book, of course. Um, a bee's knees, for anyone who doesn't know, is a prohibition era cocktail. Cocktail, that's gin and honey and lemon. And supposedly it was developed because the old bathtub gin tasted so bad, you put lemon and honey in it to make <laughs> it taste had better. You to make it taste better. Exactly. exactly. And I, I thought, oh, we have to find out. Well, so now we know a sidecar is your fallback. Yes. What's your favorite cocktail? I, if I, if I had to pick one, I, I do love a bee's knees, but I tend to go for a last word. Oh. Um, which is, a, I'm a gin girl. It's a gin and green chartreuse and maraschino and lime. You know, I just literally, t earlier today, I tweeted about this. I was interviewing the new Joy of Cooking authors, um, John Becker and Megan Scott, and they have a last word recipe in the ah, new Joy. Very nice. So very nice. I love, I love that, that we're having this like classic cocktail, like renaissance. Yes. And that you're finding all these things again. Yes. And, and things, I was going to say, if I decided to draw up the Morgenstern, 
You know, it would definitely have honey in it, it and to. maybe some apricot brandy. But I also mm. choo- chose gin. I'm so glad to know you're a gin yes, girl. Yes, I'm very much a gin person. <laughs> I realized that I, I started doing this thing where I think I'm becoming a gin hoarder because if I see an interesting gin, mm-hmm. I like I almost always pick it up. And then I looked at my bar, and I had I think I had 18 different gins. And my husband doesn't really drink. <laughs> and so he's it like, lasts. I am, I know it does. And I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, pro- but I probably could get away with not buying gin for a very long time, but, but then I keep finding fascinating ones. Have you tried Monkey 47? I, I have Monkey 47. It's so good. It's very good. It's yes. one of my good gifting gins. Yes. I also buy gin for other people because I'm a gin enabler. It, it, you know, this is, a, I think this is a fine way to go, you know, um, just, and then we'll get off the, the alcohol. Uh, yeah. But Hendrix, we have books this, to talk. This but. year has this fabulous thing with the bottle of Hendrix and then this little ceramic cucumber spice. What? Yes. I have not seen this. Oh, yeah. Got to stock up. Okay. Everyone's getting that for Christmas. Good call. <laughs> Sorry, Todd. Sorry to Spoilers. <laughs> spoil a surprise. That's right. I know. You need one. I do. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's interesting. It's about Zachary. I think, you know, Zachary has decided tastes. And he knows who he is. He has other things in his life that are sort of open-ended, things mm. that he's wondering about. But, you know, Zachary, Ezra Rollins, our protagonist this time. I again. always started every chapter with his full name. Yes, and at did. one point I got that note to me. Like, do you really need to do that? I was like, yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, she does. There was something I liked about grounding and you knew exactly where you were and who you were with. And it sounds nicely old-fashioned yes. storyteller to like do the full name to kind of establish like where you are and who you're with. It really does. And I, at one point had the same question. I thought, does she need to do this? And then I said the opening lines to myself without the full name and it didn't sound as lovely. Yeah. I I do a lot of that. Like I, it has to sound right. Like I'll rewrite even single sentences just Mm -hmm. to, to make sure they have the beats that I want just the cadence of mm-hmm. each sentence. And sometimes like, I'll fuss over something and then I'll sit down and realize, oh, I could just take two words out and it's fine. Do you read things, out, like, do you read entire chapters out loud to yourself? I'll do, I'll do almost everything out loud at one point or another, but I, I kind of read it to myself in my head so I can mm-hmm. hear it. Um, Cause I, I get really big on rhythm of prose and how, like, I don't know what I'm doing with commas, but I know like <laughs> what, like oh, how I want it to sound if mm-hmm. you read it out loud and how I want it to sound when you're sort of reading it in your head. And I actually blame Margaret Atwood for this. That's it. Because <laughs> blame her Peggy. Um, when I, <laughs> when I was a Smith, we, I took a modern women writing class, uh, modern women writers. And one of the things we read for that class was Alias Grace. Mm-hmm. And I, I love that book. And one of the things we did for that class was um, our professor had us read the opening paragraphs, like the whole prologue, mm-hmm. one sentence per person around the room. Oh, wow. The first sentence of Alias Grace is, out of the gravel, there are peonies growing. And I know that because that has been in my head for 21 years since mm-hmm. that class. And I think like that's sort of where that that was probably the best like pacing and and like rhythm and like just the musicalness of that prose Mm -hmm. really kind of just stuck in my brain. And also I read that really late at night sitting in my window and I could see the old uh, Massachusetts state hospital, you know, the closed down one there's like that you could see and like, did you do that? Did you go and like, I lived in Tyler. So I was always going up there. Yeah. (laughs) This was like a thing you did at Smith. You like went to like at night to go like walk around so like the grounds of the like old abandoned oh, yeah. state hospital. <laughs> As one does. As one does, yes. exactly. It was very atmospheric. It was. Well, and speaking of musicality and prose and atmosphere, I would love to have you read a little. Should I read a thing? Yes. Okay, we're going to do something fun. Um, I'm going to go back there to read, but to decide what I am going to read. Thank you, Garcon. Thank you, Todd. <laughs> I am going to have you pick a card. Okay. Um, Because I don't know if anyone saw um, on Instagram and Twitter for the uh, run up to the book, we had um, cards that were designed by an illustrator named Erica Williams um, that each feature symbols from the book. And so I have three different symbol cards here. And uh, there are fairy tales within the book. And whichever card Beth Ann picks, I'm going to read the appropriate fairy tale. This is a lot of pressure. No pressure. (laughs) So you're going to read one of the fortunes and fables? Yes. Which one, though? 
Oh, <laughs> uh, I know. Please. Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. Um, do you want me to shuffle them again? No, I'm left handed. Okay, so we'll go that one. We're going to go with What did you one. pick? I picked. You picked the key. The key. Okay, here we go. I love it. You can hold on. To it. <laughs> I'll need it back. Otherwise, like no one will ever get to the key reading ever again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See, there there are several different books within the book, and I'm talking because I didn't mark my pages. Um, and one of the books within the book is called Fortunes and Fables, and Fortunes and Fables is a collection of fairy tales. And this one is called The Key Collector. Once there was a man who collected keys, old keys and new keys and broken keys, lost keys and stolen keys and skeleton keys. He carried them in his pockets and wore them on chains that clattered as he walked around the town. Everyone in the town knew the key collector. Some people thought his habit strange, but the key collector was a friendly sort and had a thoughtful air and a quick smile. If someone lost a key or broke a key, they could ask the key collector, and he would usually have a replacement that would suit their needs. It was often faster than having a new key made. The key collector kept the most common shapes and sizes of keys always at hand, in case someone was in need of a key for a door or a cupboard or a chest. The key collector was not possessive about his keys. He gave them away when they were needed. Though often, people would have a new key made anyway and return the one that they had borrowed. People gave him found keys or spare keys as gifts to add to his collection. When they traveled, they would find keys to bring back with them, keys with unfamiliar shapes and strange teeth. They called the man himself the key collector, but a great many people aided with the collecting. Eventually, the key collector had too many keys to carry and began displaying them around his house. He hung them in the windows on ribbons like curtains and arranged them on bookshelves and framed them on walls. The most delicate ones he kept under glass or in boxes meant for jewels. Others were piled together with similar keys, kept in buckets or baskets. After many years, the entire house was filled near to bursting with keys. They hung on the outside as well, over the doors and the windows, and draped from the eaves of the roof. The key collector's house was easily spotted from the road. One day, there was a knock upon his door. The key collector opened the door to find a pretty woman in a long cloak on his doorstop. He had never seen her before, nor had he seen embroidery of the sort that trimmed her cloak, star-shaped flowers in gold thread on dark cloth, too fine for travel, though she must have traveled far. He did not see a horse or a carriage, and supposed she might have left them at the inn, for no one passed through this town without staying at the inn, and it was not far. "'I have been told you collect keys,' the woman said to the key collector. "'I do,' said the key collector, though this was obvious. There were keys hanging above the doorway where they stood, keys on the walls behind him, keys in jars and bowls and vases on the tables.' I am looking for something that has been locked away. I wonder if one of your keys might unlock it. You are welcome to look, the key collector said, and invited the woman inside. He considered asking the woman what manner of key she sought so he might help her look, but he knew how difficult it was to describe a key. To find a key, you had to understand the lock. So the key collector let the woman search the house. He showed her every room, every cabinet and bookshelf lined with keys. The kitchen with its teacups and wine glasses filled with keys, save for the few that were used more frequently, empty and waiting for wine or for tea. The key collector offered the woman a cup of tea, but she politely refused. He left her to her searching and sat in the front parlor where she could find him if she needed, and he read a book. After many hours, the woman returned to the key collector. It is not here, she said. Thank you for letting me look. There are more keys in the back garden, the key collector said, and led the woman outside. The garden was festooned with keys strung from ribbons in a rainbow of colors. Keys tied with bows hung from trees and bouquets of keys displayed in, in uh, sorry, Uh, keys, bouquets of keys were displayed in glazed pots and vases. Bird cages with keys hung on the tiny swings inside with no birds to be seen. Keys set into the paving stones along the garden paths. A bubbling fountain contained piles of keys beneath the water, sunken like wishes. The light was fading, so the key collector lit the the lanterns. It is lovely here, the woman said. She began to look around through the garden keys, keys held by statues and keys wound around topiaries. She stopped in front of a tree that was just starting to blossom, reaching out to a key, one of many hanging from red ribbons. Will that key suit your lock, the key collector asked. More than that, the woman answered. This is my key. 
I lost it a very long time ago. I'm glad it's, I, it's found its way to you. I'm glad to return it, the key collector said. He reached up to untie the ribbon for her, leaving it hanging from the key in her hand. I must find a way to repay you, the woman said to the key collector. No need for that, the key collector told her. It is my pleasure to help re reunite you with your locked away thing. Oh, the woman said, it is not a thing. It is a place. She held the key out in front of her at a height above her waist where a keyhole might have been if there was a door, and part of the key vanished. The woman turned the key, and an invisible door unlocked in the middle of the key collector's garden. The woman pushed the door open. The key and its ribbon remained hanging in midair. The key collector looked through the door into a golden room with high arched windows. Dozens of candles stood on tables laid for a great feast. He heard music playing and laughter coming from out of sight. Through the windows, he could see waterfalls and mountains, a sky brightly lit by two moons, and countless stars reflected in a shimmering sea. The woman walked through the door, her long cloak trailing over the golden tiles. The key collector stood in his garden, staring. The woman took the key on its ribbon from its lock. She turned back to the key collector. She raised a hand in invitation, beckoning him forward. The key collector followed. The door closed behind him. No one ever saw him again. Thank you so much. Now, Thank you. I haven't actually read that one before. That's the like, I don't remember how to read this. I can't <laughs> But, you know, that brings up, we, we've talked a little bit about bees. We've talked a little bit about keys. But doors are so yes. important in the starless sea. Endlessly important, really. And I wanted to, when I think of doors, uh, I always think of Janus, the, the two-faced god. Mm. And I think of thresholds and, you know, stepping over in that liminal space. And there's so much that is like a fable in what you just read, like a myth, but also archetypal, mm -hmm. uh, um, very human. And what is it like to create these, you know, fortunes and fables? I mean, do you go into almost a different space in those places in the book when you're writing them? Because they're not the same as Zachary's narrative. No, they're very different. The, very different. the fairy tales kind of came up I think I was actually being a brat because I think I had a, a draft where my editor came back and suggested maybe like dialing down the fairy taleiness, and I was just like, "Well, no, I'm going to actually write fairy tales on." Um, it's going way up. <laughs> I was just like, "No, how about more fairy tales?" But I actually think it, what it needed was more fairy tales because it was it needed to commit to to having that fairy tale aspect. So I started thinking about having one of the books within the book be fairy tales. And then I just started writing them sort of individually mm -hmm. and not really trying to make them match with the main narrative at all, just sort of writing them all in isolation. And, but one of the things I, I did was try to have them um, reflect some of the symbols that I already had. So mm -hmm. I had like a little notes and I think, I think I tried to do one for each of the six symbols mm -hmm. that are sort of prevalent. And, and I think, there's four that are obvious and there's two that's like, nah, it didn't really go quite as obvious, D but it still works. Didn't need to force it. No. No. And I wanted them to feel like they like worked on their own. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of th them will come, some of them will come back and echo in different parts of the story How as well. How many fortunes and fables there are there? six. I was going to say they would make a lovely little book on their own. <laughs> you know, it's true. A little chat. There are, there's, there's several different books within the book. Exactly. So this is a a novel. It is a novel, but it's also books within the book and they're different types of books. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to I like to, to get, keep things nice and simple. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm trying to get to without stumbling over my own words is that this is a book that was originally something you intended to write about books, but mm -hmm. it wound up being about stories. Yeah. I set out, I have to, after the night circus, cause the night circus was kind of a thing. Um, <laughs> and it was not at all what I was expecting it to be. And it was a little overwhelming. And then almost immediately I started getting the, when's your next book coming out? And I thought, this one took me like five years to write. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the next one might take me at least a little while. And then no one was waiting for the night circus and people were waiting for this one. And it is a lot of pressure. And I think yes. 
I kept asking myself, well, why am I writing this in the first place? Mm -hmm. And why does one write a book? And that got me back to books about books. And so that's what I thought I was doing for a very long time. And then I started realizing I kind of wanted to expand it beyond books into story. Because I think that, like there's a subtle but important difference between- That's what I wanted you to talk oh, about. Yay. I, I, I was picking up what you were putting down. Good. Um, I think a story is malleable. Mm-hmm. A story can change and a story can have variations and retellings and different aspects. And it doesn't have to be a set fixed single volume mm-hmm. book. And one of the things that got me on this path was um, I was thinking about narrative structure and mm-hmm. I was thinking about fairy tale retellings and der- different versions of myths. And I was playing Dragon Age Inquisition, um, <laughs> at, which for anyone who doesn't know is a, a role playing video game and the choices that you make influence the narrative. Like you can make certain choices and people are going to die and you can make other choices and like you're not even going to see some of the story. It's, it's very much going to dictate mm-hmm. how that story plays out for you based on your choices. And I thought oh, this fits so nicely with stuff that I'm already working on. And that was when I decided to have, um, I had Zachary in my head as a grad student, as like, he was wearing his sweaters and he's like on campus in January in the snow, drinking his like bourbon spiked hot cocoa. (laughs) But I wasn't entirely sure what he was studying. Mm -hmm. Um, And I thought maybe he was, an English major, but that seemed a little like too on the nose. And, and then <laughs> guy in your yes, MFA. It, yeah. A little bit. <laughs> and then, and then I had that light bulb moment of, Oh, you can probably get advanced degrees in game study now, which of course you can. Yes. And that like opened up a whole other aspect to it. And I like to think there, there are a lot of video game references. There's a lot, but I think I just tried to have it have a little bit of video game flavor, sort of mm-hmm. the way the Night Circus has a little bit of a Shakespearean flavor. Right. Well, and I wanted to ask you about that because, um, you know, Zachary, of course, being an emerging media grad student, you know, gives a, a meta flavor to his going through these adventures. I remember um, when Mist came out. That yes. is really in the, the, yes. the mists of time, long time ago. But I was so excited about it because being a huge nerd, uh, I loved to play it. And my husband and my father-in-law could never get me interested in anything else. No other video game, nothing. And they said, why do you like Mist so much? You know, and why haven't you won already? And I said, because that's what's so great. You don't have to win. You just get to a place and you work on the puzzle. And then maybe you see a new little vista. And RPGs now are so sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So you can get different. You can go down different rabbit holes. Yeah. Um, Of course, you know, or or honey holes. (laughs) That's that didn't. That's not that, the way I meant it to sound. No. Uh, that's that a different not, book. <laughs> that is totally different book. Sorry, um, but you know. Is that, <laughs> oh, this is why. No, no, no never, this never, is the best. <laughs> this is the best. <laughs> um, Zachary goes through a lot of different doorways mm-hmm. and into a lot of different spaces, and you know, at one point. Um, Dorian, another mm-hmm. character, does drown, almost drown in a, a sea. It, it's honey. adventure. Yes, in his adventure. So it, fe- <laughs> I wanted it to feel like a game. Yeah, I wanted it to exactly. feel like Zachary was on some sort of quest, even if he didn't know what exactly he mm-hmm. was questing for. I wanted it to feel like he was making choices and there were other choices that he could have made. Um, which is a hard thing to do in a single narrative novel. Um, so it was kind of like, I just had to make the best choices I could or the best choices to serve the story in the way I wanted it to feel. But I like that. I always like a story that feels like there's more going on than just what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. I like it to feel like there's something else going on down this strange hallway or there's some other adventure that you could have had if you'd chosen door number three instead of door number two and like trying to make it feel like there were all those like options as if it was a game, even though I was only writing. Actually, no, I wrote a lot of them. I just took them out of the book. Um, Because I write, I overwrite. I write a lot more than I'm ever going to use. And uh, at what point did you 
for instance, know that the ballad of Simon and Eleanor is that? Did I get yes. the, yeah, that? That part yet another book com- within yet the book. another book within the book was coming in because that delightfully complicates things. Well, it, not delightfully for them necessarily, no. but for me, <laughs> it, I, I kind of did that thing where it's just like you're, you start on one level, and then there's another book, and then there's another book, mm-hmm. and then we get into all these stories are the same story because again, I like a very simple narrative. Um, but I, I had I always start with space, and I started with this underground library esque right. space in my head before I knew what the story of it was going to be, and I don't like calling it a library always because everyone just kind of defaults to underground library and it never really, not really felt like a library yeah. to me. And it, it struck me after talking about it and thinking about it, it's because it doesn't have librarians. Like it's just okay. a, like, I think like- The a, acolytes aren't really no, librarians. Well, no one there is really going to help you all that much. <laughs> That's true. Like It's a little more of a like, you are left to your own devices in this space. and Except for the kitchen. Yes. The kitchen is my, like, That's I like to write magical things that- are things that I want. So there's a thing in this space called the kitchen, which is essentially every room, which every room is basically like the best hotel room ever has a dumb waiter on the wall and you can write it what you want, anything you possibly want, write down on a piece of paper and send it down. I was going to say it's, (laughs) it's literally just the replicator from Star Trek. It is the replicator from Star Trek, but but it's fantastic. Yes. You know, I mean there, and that's another thing. Uh, Anyone who's read the night circus will understand this, but in the starless sea, I feel like you took um, the fun references up a notch. You know, we've got Narnia, we've got elements. It's everything from Hogwarts to game of Thrones. We've got little bits of, but not, Necess- Narnia is called out on yes. its own um, and there is a wardrobe. I won't go any further than that. But uh, there are so many things that are pull from other stories that we all love and follow. I liked being, I had a good like way to be self-referential. So you could reference all these different fairy tales and, and books and I wanted to be able to, f- have it feel like it was old and new at the same time. Mm -hmm. So it starts out having a lot of sort of modern references and what Zachary's reading and what, um, like it has video game references. And then I kind of purposely let it dissolve as the, the book kind of comes into its own Mm -hmm. story. And, but I wanted it to feel like it had all those pieces of all these other stories. So I think sometimes you'll read even, um, modern set fantasy that doesn't reference other fantasy. It always struck me, um, I heard Love Grossman say once that Harry Potter would have been reading the heck out of the Narnia books in right. that cupboard under the stairs. And it's almost weird that he wasn't. Right. Like it, like that kid in that situation would be the escapist reader kid. Right. And so that was one of those things that I, I thought about when I was kind of creating Zachary as a character. Like he's aware of these things. And so I had that juggling act of having a character who knows how this sort of story works <laughs> in this sort of story. Right, right, exactly. And and uh, it, it's just um, amazing. I just have a few minutes before I turn it over to all of you because I know you have tons of questions. But what comes next? Am I allowed to ask that? Do you have anything you would like to share? What, like next book? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, this is, all, this is all I'll say because it's not coming for like, uh, four years, like minimum. Um, I'm not rushing you. No, well, Karen. okay. A couple of things. <laughs> My writing process is long and slow and messy. And I have to write things and rewrite them and rewrite them even before I figure out sort of what I want to do with something. And I start with space and I start with tones, and then I kind of have to see who wants to live in my head. Mm-hmm. And so that's sort of where I am right now. Um, the only things I'll say about it is um, the Night Circus is an autumnal book. The Starless Sea is very much a winter creature. Obviously, I have to write a spring book. Absolutely. So, if right. If only to get to like spring colors. Uh, yes. Right? <laughs> I, I feel like we need some. So, I, I'm all mud and cherry blossoms. <laughs> and the only other hint you get is that I'm rereading a lot of Shirley Jackson. Oh. 
And we'll see what happens. It probably won't be anything like that by the time it's finished. That is an excellent clue, especially because Eleanor's name came from The Haunting of Hill House. Eleanor is named after Eleanor from Haunting of Hill House. So that, which is very cool uh, indeed. Now, one, another question that someone might be out there waiting to ask is about the Night Circus movie. They don't tell me anything. (laughs) No, you think I'm kidding. I found out we had, apparently has a director. I found out on Twitter. Like, <laughs> I, th- this admittedly was my fault because I was very busy with Star C things and I told my agent to not tell me, like not bother me with any film stuff unless it was important. And apparently we had different definitions of what counted as important. But he didn't know they were going to announce it. And he was very apologetic, but like, yeah, it was a weird thing to find out on Twitter, but I do believe it is still in what I believe they refer to as development hell. Okay. Okay. That's a technical term. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there's been like, like this, like Summit optioned it, but then Summit became part of Lionsgate. Right. And then like, like it's like, cause there's I all got these the different point, posters like, for it. it do people Online. do like fan yeah. art posters for I guess, it? yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. I stopped asking questions after a certain point. I was just like, how about you don't tell me anything? Oh. And I'll just, okay. I have hope that someday maybe it'll be some sort of film or television something. I like, I'm kind of at that point where I have to sort of divorce myself from it because I'm of not course. involved in it. But right after I sold the book, before The Night Circus came out, I was living in Salem, Massachusetts. And I, of course, go out and people watch on Halloween. And I was standing downtown in Salem and this woman just, it's crowded, so everyone's sort of on top of each other. And this woman standing next to me, smoking, with big sunglasses, just starts talking to me and just chatting and like asked if I was local. And, and she says, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a writer. I just sold my first book. And she looks me at sort of like up and down. I was like, can't tell. She has big sunglasses mm-hmm. on. And like, she goes, oh, you're going to be big. You're going to be like Anne Rice big. There's going to be a movie. It's going to have beautiful cinematography. Okay. So the only things I believe about any potential film thing is it's going to have this beautiful woman cinematography. <laughs> And you're going to be big. Yes, Anne Rice apparently. big. I don't know if I want to be Anne Rice big. I can stay where I am. <laughs> um, and uh, that reminds me also to ask um, about, uh, it just went out of my head. It's, oh, I know. See, she didn't want me to ask. That woman what? didn't want me to ask about Madame Love Rollins. Oh, this is, this is an, uh, Zachary's mother is mm. a, a fortune teller. Um, and I actually, this is in the acknowledgements. I got the name Madame Love right. Rollins off of a tomb in Salem, Massachusetts. I wanted to make sure she mentioned that. I, I thought that was really I cool. I just loved that name. It has such nice, like the, going back to the musicality and the rhythm of the words, I just really liked that name. Yes. I have no idea who she was. I didn't, I never looked her oh, up. You've created your own she's, love role. I was going to say, wonderful. She, she bears no resemblance to the person as far okay. as I know. But I, I love that story. I love that. A good spooky November um, bit of mm-hmm. uh, trivia there. Now, I know you have questions. We have microphones for you. So if you would please, many of you know the drill, line up at the microphones um, and ask a question. Remember- Is there just this one right here? No, there's there's also one one over here. here. There's also one over here. Um, No book pitches, please. Uh, (laughs) And, you know, questions, uh, comments are okay as long as you keep them to a minimum. So thank you so much and go. Okay. Okay. I I can do this. Okay. Yes, you can. I wanted to ask about the cats, actually. Because you talk about the bees and all the symbolism of the bees and stuff and all the big, the main, main symbols of the book. But the cats are very much a thing that aren't necessarily as, like, acknowledged. And, like, like the, all the other symbols and stuff are, like, on the dice later. But the cats are just doing their own thing. So I was wondering, just, I realize that's what cats do. I was going to say it seems so, cat appropriate that they're that just there. The extent of my interaction with cats is his cats. But, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I just want to know why the cats, how, where did they come from? Okay. Uh, yeah, I can talk about cats. Question. Also, what's your squishable bee's name, if I can ask? Oh, I don't think I gave him a name. Oh, now I feel bad. I should have named him. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to think about that, and you I'll can talk. Name him Zachary. Oh, that's a good idea. I might have to do that. Um, oh, so, okay. So cats. Um, I feel like I need to take an opportunity to say you can follow my cat on Instagram. She, <laughs> she is Lady Vesper the cat. She is the cutest cat in the world. Um, I, I feel like cats and books seemed like an obvious combination. And there are cats in this space. There are a lot of cats in this space. And they're kind of just doing their own thing. 
in that way that cats do. And I, I liked having them there as that all of the animals that appear in the Starless Sea, there are, um, there are cats, there are owls, there are bees. They are all animals that in one way or another are related to underworld mythology. Um, so it seems appropriate that they're all Even there. Even a polar bear coat. <laughs> a polar bear coat. I suppose that counts as another animal. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think it just felt like they would be there. And I'm not going to, they do kind of play a role. One cat in particular. Um, and I did have someone tweet at me asking if one of the cats it's briefly mentioned is Vesper, my cat. And she actually, the cat in the book predates Vesper. But there is at one point, I think, a silver tabby in there. Um, I just like cats. I tend to just put things in that I like. <laughs> yes. Um, but I, I, I wanted a way also that the space that you're in, in this, in this underground, very large space does not have a lot of people in it at the time the story takes place, but I wanted it to still feel alive. And one of the reasons uh -huh. it does is there, there are cats kind of hiding around corners and sleeping on books. Thank you. That's a great question over here. Um, this is related to the night circus. Mm -hmm. Um, what inspired you to write that? Um, the Night Circus came about kind of by surprise. I was writing and I started writing seriously doing something called National Novel Writing Month. It's a challenge to write 50,000 words in 30 days, which is a lot of words in not a lot of days. And that's how I started writing a lot because I, before I would write a page and I would hate it. So I'd throw it away, which isn't the way to write a book. You need to keep writing pages. And I was getting very bored with what I was writing. I had this sort of Edward Gorey-esque mm -hmm. plot where like there were guys in fur coats being mysterious and doing very little else. <laughs> and I got really bored with it and I thought, I want something exciting to happen. And I thought, I'll send these characters to the circus. Mm -hmm. And immediately there was a circus in my head and it was a lot of different striped tents and there was a bonfire in the middle and I didn't know why. And immediately the circus was way more interesting. And I decided I was just going to write about the circus for a while. And that is what eventually turned in to the night circus. But it just could have started by accident. A very fortunate accident. Very fortunate accident. Thank you. Actually, thank you very much for that lead in because I have a nano question yes. um, or a nano tangential question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I knew that you wrote uh, the, the night circus over a process of different National Novel Writing mm -hmm. Months, which is very encouraging. On yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, I wasn't sure about the Starless Sea, and I wanted to know whether there were elements of your process that you kept for the Starless Sea or anything that you changed in particular that was that you sort of discovered in the process of your first novel that you were able to incorporate in the creation of your second. Uh, it, the process for this one was similar in many ways and different in others. Um, I actually did a Nano Month like uh, encouragement some, letter. Like, yeah. No, I, <laughs> I did, I did that too. But I did a nano draft of like sort of this book. It bears little to no resemblance to Most. the finished product. But I did kind of, I played in this space for a a November back in like to 2008 or 2009. Um, n nothing from that is in the book. There's, there's maybe a little bit of architecture somewhere, but that's it. And the main thing that I did that was the same is I wrote it all wrong first. And I think that's just how I write. I think that's the way I figure out what I want to do is to try it and see what works and see what doesn't, and then go back and do it again. And I think uh, doing National Novel Writing Month so many times helped me just get that sort of process like where I can just like spew out all these words and just be fine with knowing that I'm not necessarily going to use all these. And throw them away. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Well, I mean that like I, I probably threw away as many words to write this book three or four times over. Like I wrote like sections over and over again. I wrote sections that aren't in the book anymore. I wrote, there's a, the good example is there's a character who's mentioned in passing approximately twice. And I wrote tens of thousands of words of her diaries. Um, Cause I thought at one point, maybe it was part of the book and I was wrong. Um, 
but this was different because at least I could kind of trust my process a little more that I would get somewhere eventually because when you're in the middle of that word soup phase where nothing seems to make sense and it is not book shaped in any way, shape or form, like it's a little hard to keep going, but I figured I remembered how messy those stages of the night circus had been and just kind of kept like pushing. And like, I was still surprised the day that my editor said, Oh great, we're done. And I said, we were what now? Um, <laughs> But I was ready to let it go, and that's how I think I knew it was. I knew it was done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, we have we have the popular microphone. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I, f I find it very interesting, right? Because I picked up your book at first, the the Night Circus at first, when I was I was probably thirteen. <laughs> I'm twenty two now. Right. Oh, that just made me feel so old. <laughs> it, makes, okay. it makes me feel old because I, as I, uh, I've, I've picked it up again to read it again mm. over the years and it's kind of hit me in different ways, which I think is interesting as I grew up and started to actually be the age of the people in the book and such. Uh, but what I found really interesting so far of all the questions, including my own in the discussion here, it's not a sequel, The, the Star of the Sea, mm -hmm. right? But how, how do you carry your voice and your your energy from the previous book through to the second book? Ooh. Um, that's a really good question. I, I thought about this a lot because the second book is my chance to kind of establish what makes something Morgan Sternian, mm -hmm. like what, what's an Aaron Morgan Stern book. And I think I try to just, most of, what I write is just stuff I like and stuff that I would want to read and things that appeal to my sensibilities. And I think you end up with this sort of tone that I guess is just my tone that is a little bit fantastical and a little bit grounded in reality. And there's probably cats somewhere. <laughs> and, um, and I, I think I just had to still let it sound like me and not try to make it sound like anything else. And I knew it was, it's, it's not a sequel. It's not set in the same sort of time period the Night Circus was. It's very much its own thing. But I think there are some similarities in, in tone and, and flavor and kind of, like, I, I hope it still, I, I think it's if you like more one, you will probably like the other. <laughs> I hope. Thank you. Thank you. So a little earlier, you said that when you were starting this, you were thinking about books about books. Um, and I know you said that this kind of inspiration came from video games, um, and you have some references to modern fantasy mm -hmm. in your book. But what were the books about books that you kind of drew inspiration from, or what books or authors? Um, let's see, one of my favorite like, books about books. The one that I got that's name-checked in The Star of the Sea is uh, The Shadow of the Wind. Um, and my other one that I love that probably did kind of have a little bit of a flavor, um, influence was Mr. Penumbra's 24 hour bookstore. Um, if you haven't read that, it's amazing. <laughs> did you know that that original hardcover that glows in the dark? Yes. I love that. More books should glow in the dark. More, books more candlelit should, book yes. events, more yes. books that glow in the dark. Those are kind of my very favorites. Um, and I, I, I did really think that's sort of what I wanted. And then I realized that I had books like that, that were, I, I, I could just read Mr. Penumbra's again, and that's there. So I kind of wanted to do something different with it. And that's where it got kind of expansive. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, what kind of, like, what would you want someone who reads the Starless Sea to kind of take away with them after they've read the book? Ooh, I always like think this is a heavy question because it seems like I'm telling people what to do. Like I think one of the things I like about the writing process is that like it's collaborative. Like I get to write the story, but the reader gets to interpret it for themselves. There's a bit in the Star of the Sea that says, and with all the symbols, that um, symbols are for interpretation and not definition. So I don't really want to define what I think the reader experience should be. Um, and I hope that every reader gets something unique from it, um, which is a kind of like 
way to dodge this question. <laughs> but I don't know. That's kind of like I agree with that because I've talked with a bunch of different people about a bunch of different books and everyone kind of seems to have their own interpretation. Yeah. So I was just kind of curious how like after if I, well, when I read it, what I would kind of take away from it and compare that. So. You know, um, just to, uh, to, just to butt in, I would say that what I took away from it is it, the Starless Sea reminded me that stories are infinite, that books have covers and beginnings and middles and ends, but stories have endless possibilities, infinite possibilities. And even if you think you know what happens to Zach and Dorian, or if you think you know what happens to Simon and Eleanor, you don't have the full story. And that's actually a wonderful thing, and we forget that sometimes. So that's just what I took away. That was really good. I might Thank have you. to steal that. <laughs> you may. Me. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, um, I'm also from Massachusetts, Yay. so I always appreciated in the Night Circus, like how part of it was set in Concord, so I could really envision myself there. Were there any elements in the Starless Sea that you like saw in the real world or were inspired by like real locations? Okay, we're going to come nicely full circle. Zachary's school I put in Vermont, but it's Smith. <laughs> um, I... Um, he, it's the campus, the the snow, the um. It starts during something called uh, J term, which is January term, which we had at Smith. Whereas like the three weeks um after the holiday break, but before spring classes started again, you'd have people would be on campus um, rehearsing theater productions or doing like student led classes, and that like all of that is in the book. It's all Northampton. It it's is. It, yeah. And it's Vermont. <laughs> like, I, I actually moved it to Vermont mostly because I didn't want to type the word Massachusetts over and over again. <laughs> so that is definitely real. And then there are several, there are several actual bookstores. There is a, um, a bookstore cameo by The Strand in New York. Um, there's um, that also the giant Barnes and Noble that's in Union Square is in there. Um, and a lot of the book takes place in New York. Some there's uh, actually there's way more than I thought there was when New I started answering this question. Library, the New York Public Library is in there. Patience and Fortitude, um, the lions from the New York Public Library are in there, and not like well, just the lions. They're where they are outside the library, um, and then the Algonquin Hotel is in there as well. Thank you. Where I spent my honeymoon. <gasps> really. Did they have the hotel cat then? Of course Matilda was there. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. They've had, like, different iterations of yeah. Matilda. There have been many Matildas. Many Matildas, yes. So um, that, that that was a neat story. The founders of Infocom put MIT in some of the early um, text computer games, so it's a long tradition. Um, I was wondering, um, when you said the uh, more books should glow in the dark, I was wondering how about a... Uh, a radium age fantasy homage for summer. And I was wondering, um, I was wondering, uh, since you have video games, if you've, uh, thought about doing anything with like tabletop role-playing games since Ooh. this, the circus homage called the extinction curse is coming out. Wouldn't in, a night circus board soon. game be fantastic? Something like that. that. Yeah. Cool. Or, or something like with the whole collaborative, aspect of the storytelling to it and if you that if would be lovely anything, um i like hadn't that. thought about it i haven't done too many tabletop things i have friends who are very into tabletop games who would be all over this um but no it that's something i'd love to like have I mean, the expanse started do. that way and yeah. look at it now it's huge like, that would be fun like oh uh, i don't know how you have these things happen though settlers yeah. of the starless yeah. sea <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Like, I do think it's really like interesting the things you can do with a game and that and that collaborative storytelling aspect. I like um, how many different ways there are to tell stories, and I love I love that we're kind of in a, a gaming renaissance right now. We're having like more tabletops and more video games, and like I like I like uh, absorbing story in as many forms as possible. So, That's thank cool. you. We have time for one more question. Yeah. And then we'll move on to the signing. Yes, okay, absolutely. Cool. So right over here, sir. It's actually very quick. 
I can, okay. Am I down there quick? Okay. <laughs> a, 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 a very quick circular story. My best friend handed me a copy of Night Circus uh, as a gift on my birthday to read because she knew I was obsessed with, with Ray Bradbury and I loved Something Wicked This Way Comes. That's why I ended up reading The Night Circus. Excellent. That same best friend just landed in Barcelona today. And for her trip to Barcelona, she and I both started reading today this book that you just Yay, mentioned. Yay, Shadow, Shadow of the Wind. Of the wind. <laughs> Excellent. If you With haven't read mind. Shadow of the Wind, Carlos Luis it's, Zephon. It's a wonderful book. Yes. So that's all. That's yeah. wonderful. Yay. What a great way to end. I love that. I do too. I love ending with more book recommendations. Exactly. <laughs> that's the way it goes. So thank you all. Thank um, you. Thank you, Erin. <laughs>